Yeah. Strong opinions. Strong opinions. Strong. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, good people. Welcome to the Critic Box Podcast, where we talk movies, we talk Hollywood, we talk about how we feel, we talk about how people probably felt. And all in all, we just have a good time. Um, I really, really hope that you enjoy us. If you don't, don't let us know. Keep watching. Keep clicking anyway. Okay, we're here for keep the Keep us bait. ignorant. Keep us ignorant. <laughs> That's cool. Let us know. Let us know. You know it what? increases engagement. We're good with it. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, Sarah wants Click to know. Like I didn't say off. I wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever, guys. Hey, how you doing? Hope you all had a good time since our last episode. We are here again. We have a whole new slate of topics. Mm. Very, very current. And uh, let's just jump right into it, shall we? Let's jump. Let's do it. Okay. Okay, Lee. And we're off that cliff. Um, so we're talking about Oppenheimer, first and foremost. Oppenheimer. The movie that just won't stop giving, okay? Oppenheimer was undoubtedly the biggest film of 2023. Oh, yeah. Cillian Murphy swept a whole bunch of awards. Christopher right. Nolan was like, I'm back like I never left. All sorts of goodness going on with Oppenheimer. And coming off their Oscar win, they're now looking at not their overseas release they're going to japan y'all next thing you know they go to japan most, the most awkward no, but... release the most awkward release for that movie let's be honest okay i'm glad somebody said it yeah i yeah. mean as a fan of history i'm like yeah the whole movie was leading up to kill a lot of people in Japan. And let's just, you know just, just just be frank with that. That's exactly what the Manhattan Project was. And the release for Japan was like, that's, yeah. So that's, I don't know, mixed feelings about that one. I mean, yeah, it's it's a movie and, you know, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, that's kind of weird to have uh, like, hey, let's release the movie that was literally about us fighting you. So... I think the way they've handled that, Did you just though, say fighting? <laughs> well, tasteful. Yeah, you know what I mean. The way, me, all hand- the way that that's all handled is so tasteful in the actual movie. Like it's, mm-hmm. it is very clear that it is uncomfortable for that team as to what this weapon will be used for. You know, and that's the whole point of the argument. That's the whole point of the pe- the petitions. You know what I mean? It's all cycled around the idea that like they hate the idea that what they've now created and what is so successful is going to detro- destroy an entire civilization. Yeah, that's true. So I mean, like I and I was actually the thinking when I first realized that Oppenheimer equals Japan equals nuclear bomb equals Hiroshima. <laughs> when that finally computed in my brain, I was just like, well, I thought exactly to back to what you said about how the cuts didn't actually show mm-hmm. exactly what that bomb was made for. Like we we saw certain parts of the bomb going up, but we didn't actually see it, it in its it being used, basically, right? And, so and that, was, like, that was Nolan's plan because he was like, I wanted it from I, Oppenheimer's point of view and Oppenheimer wasn't right. in the Enola Gay in the plane dropping it. You know, like he just created it, it what it did to him and his experience right. through it. And so it was very tasteful. So, like, yes, they, they had to show that obviously this is what that weapon can do, but the fact that they didn't show what that weapon actually did. And you have to wonder if Christopher Nolan went into editing or went into writing or like they were discussions about that because they wanted to make sure that the overseas release, especially in Japan, wasn't offensive to anybody. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, and also it's like, did we need to? I mean, did we need to another footage of because um, we've seen I think I've seen it in in other movies of like uh, of what it looked like of the actual bombing of these cities, the destruction, the the chaos, the 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 murder, the all of that. Um, and it's like, did we need to do that or do we need to just let's just focus on the Manhattan Project? over up and hybrid doing all this and then he hears about it on the radio which is literally how he also heard about it you know and so it, it was a tasteful way of like i didn't need to see you know i didn't need to see it i didn't need to see so that you... like the bombing of the, ta- the cities yeah but th- here's the guy that that started all of that so it's just like as a person from that part of the world like yeah do i really want to watch this movie i really think it comes down to how the studio handles the pr mm-hmm. you understand 
it, it has to be a really delicate campaign. It has to be more about this is not your history. This is part of our history. And we feel really, really bad about it. I'm sorry, but we have offices here and we need to show this movie here. It's part of the deal type thing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I, I feel like it's going to be a very mature release, a, a very um, stoic release there and and the campaigns and the press for it and you know there, there'll probably be a lot of japanese adverts saying just go watch this movie try to put your feelings aside type of thing we need to understand the people behind this so that that's just, that's just me because when you look at the poster of the american release as the and the poster of the japanese release completely different ends of the spectrum when they were talking about that movie yeah like, isn't that not an awesome poster? I mean, that is oh, it's a, incredible. It's a cool looking poster. I mean, this looks like a troubled man um, in front of obviously the the frame structure of that was used to support um, the bomb before they detonated one of them or a number of them. Actually, I think it was just the one, and, and then they just did it live. And that's the story that the they're just trying tower. to tell. Pardon me. I think that's the view tower, if I remember correctly. Is yeah, that the they had they had a bomb in, a U- in one of the towers, and then they had a bomb further away. Yeah, so no, it's True. just like the the poster for the American release. It was just simply like, oh, okay, well, there, here's a story about this great man that greatly impacted American history, and it seems like the poster for the Japanese release is like, here's the story about this man that you know was troubled and disturbed, and he did this thing that he didn't really want to do but he kind of had to do it and it affected us all type of thing i don't know i mean this movie poster right now is just it's just giving me it's giving me iconic in a sense and because now they have a they have a visual of the guy that did it and he's he's troubled no and it's and also if you go historically in 1960 oppenheimer did go to japan um and he did go to uh the city of um i believe he went to the city of hiroshima and um but he didn't want to go to the site of it because he says i i i'm not gonna feel any worse than i did last night or the night before you know it's like i'm it's like i i wouldn't and and the japanese people actually said that Hey, we don't have any animosity towards you, or you know, we don't, we don't have any anger towards you. You did what you had to do, was you know, and uh, and everything we did, what we had to do, it was just a time, you know. And it was very, that was really nice. Stuff. You say it was a time, Jerry. It was. I, it's, it's hard it's to say because it's war, war it's, it's hell, war. it's mayhem. It all it sucked. Nobody was happy. Look, I want to see like. J- Japan was very nice about that. He I'm says just it like, was hell, a yeah, we did. Yeah, we, we did. Yeah, everybody did shit back then. It was a war. <laughs> it was horrible. It, none of it should have happened to begin with, you know. And so, but historically, that is what happened. And so, that, I thought that was very nice of it. And I think, I think, um, I'm sure, are they? I believe they're cutting it different because I'm not even sure if it's going to be dubbed or not. Like, I haven't even heard clear word one way or the other if, uh, if the movie's actually going to be dubbed or they're going to use subtitles or how they're going to do that. Well, they they now know. However, they decide to do it. They're probably really going to keep the artistic integrity of it all. But you know, yeah. just the fact that they're doing it there, I feel like it's a major leap in just public and human relations. And be like, yeah, hey, America, we're sorry, Jan. Yeah. Here's, here's our here's our apology to you and would be form. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But speaking of movie posters, because the reason why, you know, we're on this topic is because that movie poster is actually really compelling. Mm-hmm. So it got me thinking, yeah. what movie posters made you watch the movie? Because some Japanese people might just watch the movie just because of that poster. All right. Made me watch the movie or like define a movie? Like what? Well- I feel like those are different things. Things that I find intriguing versus things that like I'm like that represents the movie perfectly or different. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, because I mean, we let... got to talk. We got to talk. What are we in the 1970s where I didn't though they didn't have movie trailers yet? I just walk by the cinemas and look at the posters and pick one. Yeah, my like, own. Like... You're talking about like Jaws, which is like iconic. I mean, you know Jaws, what I mean? The Jaws, big shark is, yeah. ice, like underneath the person, like iconic. That's a poster. Uh, okay. Hundred percent. That's Scarface, the poster. Which, like again, you know what I mean. You have this juxtaposition of this like 
black, white, bright red Al Pacino, like, Uh superstar, you know what I mean? Like, or are we talking, like, Nightmare Before Christmas, which I can, like, see in my sleep, which is incredible, you know what I mean, in regards to detail, like, what's coming out of it. What is that Nightmare Before Christmas? Oh, my God, it's a... It's oh, a well, not the movie, film. or you like what the poster was? No, I don't remember the poster. Oh, the poster. I, I mean, it, it was the, the uh, full moon, the the curly little cliff that he stands on, and he's kind of looking off into it. I'm sorry, producers. Okay. Producers, like, can we uh, like can you get that number for, for Christmas? The, like the, the poster, curly poster curly <laughs> please. Who's look who's using a lifeline? Okay, no, 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 no. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up later. I'll look it yeah, up yeah. later. But okay, yeah, fine. He's on a curly okay. hill, and there's like pumpkins everywhere, and he's like, yeah. yeah. He's kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, I really need a remedial course. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that was not my jam. <laughs> okay. But it's all good. It's all good. No, but like movie posters. Okay. Yeah. Sarah, like what you're saying, like something that's like iconic that made you want to watch the film or looked at, or when you watch the film and you think back to the movie poster, you're like, oh, yes, damn, that was on point. Or just like, what do you think? The best movie poster you think that's out there of all time. I'll put, it, I'll put mine out there. I'll put mine out there. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders oh, of the really? Lost Ark, the movie poster, is beautiful because it was purposely... Uh, it looks a lot like Oppenheimer. I'm not going to lie. Oppenheimer copied Okay, there we go. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, okay. It was it looks because... a lot like Oppenheimer. I know. Yeah, I, just... <laughs> I know. I see the resemblance. It's there. Yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, just copy, really. No, it's because Spielberg um, idolized. It was like these 1920s uh, novellas that were out there. Kind of like, like um, um, uh, Penny Dreadfuls back in the day or whatever. But it was like, it was like action. It was like before graphic novels. You get these little uh, things, whatever. And that's what Indiana Jones was based off of were those right. little novellas or whatever. And um, that you get. And he was a kid. He absolutely loved it. And so that's why the poster is mimicking the the you know the triumphant hero, the archaeologist, like a whip, mid whip, just wow, whipping that around. It has the dramatic, like the different characters and the different scenes going on. It got the snakes. It got it's just a lot going. You have the the um uh with the remnants of the the giant boulder that's behind him, or whatever. You got the arc. It's just it, it has a whole lot of that old fashioned novella look to it, and that's why. Um, and it was designed for that way, and that's why I like it because it, it is a throwback to older cinema, even though this was like nineteen eighty eighty. 83 something like that it was early 80s when it was when it came out but it has that throwback to the bygone era of you know old days of cinema and and stuff like that so that's why i, I like Raised that. yeah see i love that about Steven Spielberg that. in general because he does he that in west side story you yeah. know what i mean he kept the original poster of west side story which is like 1961 you know what i mean when mm. he did the revival of it and that was like a big kind of point of controversy is like whether or not people should do that yeah, and we and do. that's and that's what Look. I think. It's a it's a it's a throwback to 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 the times before, and so it's like, hey, this is an homage to like the stuff before, but we're also going to introduce some new things to it. And I feel like that's I, I I'm for that. I like that. For one thing, I can say that that poster does capture the essence of what the later's of the. Uh, what it was all about, what the movie is all about. Like, yeah, the that's what a poster comic should book be. Nature, is... the adventure nature of it. Exactly. Is it emblematic of what the movie is? Like the poster can't be a lie. You know, it can't be like Raiders of the Lost Ark and it's a crime drama in like in you know, taking place in a courtroom. You know, it's like, no, that wouldn't be that wouldn't fit at all. Like, I mean, because Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, was action and archaeology and, and, you know, discovery and all that. And so that's what a poster should represent and have that. And I feel like it does that very well. I feel Please like don't let me get political is idea. now, though. <laughs> right? I mean, posters are different now in the sense that, like, posters are now supposed to be, like, an air of mystery to get you to come see the film. Whereas, like, uh-huh. back then, post was your, your poster was your physical media. Your poster was your yeah. advertising. You had to grab uh, people. You didn't have yeah. trailers. You didn't have Instagram. You couldn't, like, throw your trailer for an online media push. You couldn't just, like, phone up your podcast friends and be like, review my movie, though. Like, that's not what you could do even 20 years ago. You know what I mean? It was either that's you were going to see the movie poster, or it was going to be physical in a in a print ad somewhere or on a billboard, and like that was well, your cell point. It's such, essentially to speak into that point, Sarah. Breakfast at Tiffany's. It was essentially a print ad that they use Andre Hepburn for because she was the biggest actress at that time, and you didn't know what Breakfast with Tiffany's was about, but Audrey Hepburn looked really, really good. So therefore, that's what we're going to sell this movie with. It was, it was, it was, it was an advertisement. 
And I think there's still advertisements today, but I like it when movie posters can actually just like, you look at a movie poster and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that movie. Especially when we're talking about like classic movie posters. For me, I would have to say it's Dirty Dancing. Okay. I yeah. love because we're not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. Near and dear to the heart, always. Even the second <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> yeah, Havana Nights, let's go. Yeah, Havana Nights wasn't bad either. But the reason why I love this movie poster is because it's still it has that Breakfast at Tiffany's quality about it. It's very simple. It's like they used an actual scene from the movie and said, we're slapping this on the poster. This is what it is. This is all that it's about. And I don't know if that was just the choreography at the moment in time or if that was a conscious decision of like, oh, we, we got this shot. It looks good. And this is what we're going to use. But you'll always remember that dress. You'll always remember those shoes. And like, I think Patrick Swayze, he like he perf- he was the guy who perfected the all black outfit. You know what I mean? Like he just he just gave <laughs> that badass quality and he's looking down and he's so sexy. Like it just sells it. And every time you watch the movie, you're watching the movie just to get to that part. Because mm-hmm. that's all in your mind. Okay, at least, okay, I, I can't say every time you, but me. Okay. Well, and also, I mean, I'll have I, my confessional. That was my confessional. And, and what a movie poster! What a movie poster used to be. Because again, you're walking by the cinemas, you're taking your pick on what you're, what it's gonna be, whatever. It, it, the poster itself had to also tell you what genre you're about to walk in on. And you look at right. a dirty dance, and I know, okay, cool, it's gonna be like a love story, but it's you know, but it's gonna have like a, a it's almost, I don't know, it's gonna have a vibe to it. And you're like, okay, cool, that's a love story. I know, I know what to expect when I go into there. And then you're gonna watch dirty dance, like sure as hell, it's exactly what I was imagining, and then some, you know, and that's and that's what exactly it should do. Right. The the movie poster, I was completely unprepared for being a love story all, all on that topic is Moonlight. You yeah. can tell. You could not tell what that was going to be. Sometimes a movie poster is like after you've seen the movie, you look at the movie poster and you're like, oh, okay, now I get it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now. Right. They're different now. You know what I mean? Like Hallmark still tells you in their movie posters or like the rom-com movie posters still tell you like what's happening. But now movie posters are different. They're not They're not giving it away on the front page. They're not telling you what the antithesis is of the film on the front page. But as, I'm, as I'm driving on The Gardener and you see the Cineplex off of Islington, uh, very Toronto uh, centered, by the way. You'll see these ten foot by twenty foot giant movie posters, and that tells you what they're showing. And even as I'm driving by, and I should I should be paying attention to the road because it's the gardener. But I mean, some posters yeah, I'm just wild. like, that's wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I shouldn't don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, don't do it. Jared does. Um, but in some posters, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, what the hell movie is that? Or like sometimes I can't even see the name of it. Or like I'm seeing I'm like, I have no idea what that movie is and I've never heard of that movie. But then other movies you're like, okay, cool, I get it. A Despicable Seven, you know, a Despicable Me Seven or whatever. Like, okay, cool, I get that's what it is. Or you see it's me more, you... let's give them some credit. I, you know, you know and... it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then some movies where, where I'm like, I really have to look at that and that's not that's not what I should be doing for a movie poster. That it's, not, it's supposed to grab my eye and I get it, it instantly. Okay, cool. It's that genre. I can expect this, you know, when I go in to see the movie. Some of them now, I'm like, you're going a little artsy on this. Like, it makes a better thumbnail on a streaming service, but it doesn't look good as a movie poster itself. Well, and that's exactly it, right? The the use of a movie poster is now different. You know what I mean? It's for standing in front of it as an interesting backdrop. It's for advertising on social media and, like, engaging mm-hmm. It's for looking cool in the cinema. It's, you know what I mean? It's to generate buzz in a different way than it used to be. I mean, um, and you're talking to... It tell you what it's doing. And you could talk to a guy in the early early 2000s. I was in film school. I had my Shaun of the Dead poster up on my wall. I had my uh, Life, Aquat- uh, Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. I had my Reservoir Dogs. I had Fight Club, just that little bar of soap, or it was like the one with like Brad Pitt holding the bar of soap, whatever. Like, no, actually, you know what? There were two different ones of the Yeah, uh, the that Fight was Club. not about the Fight Club at all. Yo, no, that was a poster that was a lie, okay? You just it was just a bar of soap and it said Fight Club on it. That did not tell you at all what that damn movie is gonna be about. Yeah. But it wasn't no. supposed to tell you. The first rule of Fight Club you jumped up with Fight Club. No. Yeah. Like Fight Club was supposed to be, yeah, exactly. And so sometimes a movie is just supposed to be like, let me let me get you in. At least let it be interesting, you know, let me at least grab you to come on into this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess so. I mean, Scream didn't tell me it was a horror movie, like... 
It's I just thought it was a bunch of girls. What do you think yeah. you're doing? It was like half I, of I was just, bearing I said, face going, we're talking posters. Ah, okay. Like she had a phone in like, ah. Like that. I'm looking at the poster. The poster doesn't tell me that it's a horror movie. The poster oh, just tells me the movie is called Scream. It, it Producers, gives, can we, it, can we upload that? Can I see the no, Scream poster? Can I, no, it <laughs> gives me, it, it, it like, it insinuates horror because of the title. But mm -hmm. I see a bunch of pretty people smiling, looking good on the poster. That doesn't tell me it's about horror. It's oh, like, you're right. No, and it has the, uh, it has Drew Barrymore with her, um, Mia Wallace in Pulp Fiction, but blonde, like short hair with the with the bangs and everything. Yeah, you're right. I, oh yeah, I'm seeing like it's in the title. Just, I think that's like immediately there. You know what I mean? That's there in the title. You know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. Oh no, up but for. then no, it's it's the subtitle. It's the the subtext. It says someone's taken their love of scary movies one step too far. Like no, and that's okay, why it was like the you had to have the phrase at the bottom. Like that's what grabbed you. No, but we're talking visuals. Jared was basically saying yeah, that yeah. some some visuals out there for movies are better off as marketing material for movies as opposed to the actual official movie poster. Yeah, that yeah. I think screen would that's probably a marketing material, and they just put, like put a little white figure behind it and be like, okay, now we're, that's our <laughs> movie poster, but it's a feature, it's a bunch of pretty people. Please come watch us, like. Yeah, and I'm like most movies, that work. most movies sell people on the pretty people. Go see the pretty people. That's most of our celebrities. <laughs> that's literally all they're for. That's, that's what A-list that's what celebrities are for. for. You're there to yeah. go see them. <laughs> you're in there. If, so you're, again, you get really nerdy. Like your your <laughs> actors are your mana as a part of your like Yu-Gi-Oh deck. That's who your actors are. Your actors are powering up all the other things in the section, right? Those are the things that like are elevating your movie to determine your overall box office. So like that's you're not literally every Avenger movie is showing off the pretty people and then the female butts. But that's, that's all they do. Yeah. All they're the all like dudes flexing, like the girl standing from behind, like toit and everything. Like that's just like that's yeah, that's yeah, that was all the Avengers posters yeah. were. Listen, all I'm saying is Scream <laughs> did, uh, if they didn't name it Scream, I would not have guessed that, that was a horror movie at all. The horror movie that actually has a poster that looks like a horror movie is the ring. You look at the rings title. You look at the rings poster, and you mm -hmm. see it. And you're like, "Oh, I oh, know exactly what I'm going to go watch." Mm -hmm. You look at a Marvel movie poster. You know exactly what it is you're going to go see. You don't need any words. You just look at the visual, and you know what you're going to get. Scream but doesn't always give you that. that. And there's a few movies, movies out there that don't give you that. Pardon me. Is that because we have that reference for Marvel? You know what I mean? We all know what Marvel is. Yeah, it'd be pretty hard to but find even if you did it. Doesn't know what Marvel is at this point, but like. Okay. I don't know that this you is know a, what that is unless you have context for that thing. This is a survey for the producers then because there must be someone there, uh, somebody out there in this world that does not know what the Marvel movie franchise is. Mm -hmm. And if you show them a Marvel movie poster without any words, they'll say, oh, this is about a superhero. That's how good but, Marvel is. That's what I mean. You have marketing. context for a superhero. It right? is, but you even me... That, like, even me, who's seen a lot of them, I would not may not be able to tell the difference of like, oh, is it which Avengers movie is this one just by the just by the front title of it? But I mean, but yeah, you would you would absolutely say, cool, bunch of superheroes. I know what it is. Yeah, well, all I'm giving in this is that I just like to see movie posters, and it doesn't even matter what I like to see, but it's just really helpful when I see a movie poster that actually indicates what the movie is. Or if I've seen the movie and the movie poster gives me like, yeah, that was on point. That was actually giving what the movie was about. There's a lot of times where it doesn't. And if, uh, if a filmmaker wants to go for an artsy feel for their movie poster, then that's fine. That's on them. But they can't blame the audience if the audience says they're confused or they go watch the movie and they are like, well, that wasn't what I was expecting at all. I hated it. Mm hmm uh, can I say oh, another another iconic one that I remember saying in my childhood? What's that? Gremlins two. <laughs> Gremlins two. The poster. I remember seeing it. It's no. It's it's an office. Like it looks like a CEO's office. He's got a tall leather tall back leather chair. Or whatever. You don't see anybody, but he's like Doctor Claw, little gremlin like gremlin hand with a cigar, and he's ashing it on top of. Um, gizmo who's like in like an office <laughs> drawer and there's a giant scratch across the back of the chair and then you see new york and then like instantly <laughs> you're like oh my god gremlins hit new york and it's got a ceo is hitting an office whatever like you know generally what it is but it looks cool as hell like Ooh. that that to me is always like stuck out for me gremlins too that was a good movie poster
that I was, it's so that one falls into the category if it's entertainment. Yes, which it was. Was it movie entertainment? Gremlins, it was entertaining as hell. I okay. love Gremlins too. I'm still afraid of those little green is, things. Though, so. didn't you should know be. What Gremlins one was. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean exactly because because if you've seen Gremlins one, which the movie poster like. Look, you're not going to be able to explain how a mogwai turns into a gremlin and they get angry. There's no way you can tell that in a movie poster. So the so the Gremlins 1 poster was, you know, they were trying. Gremlins 2, it's like, y'all, you knew what Gremlins 1 was about. This is 2. We're in New York. You know, it's like, hell yes. Look, there it is. It was, a, Love it was impossible it. not to know what Gremlins 1 was about. I mean, they the new were, batch. Like, when I watched commercials, mm -hmm. they were just running around the screens on the commercials just... Big little shit disturbers. I mean, yeah, but, that's grim. No, I, I, but I do see what you're saying about that movie poster. It looks fun. It yeah. looks fun. It looks like something. It looks like you're, you're gonna like. Oh, hey, we got a new chapter, and it's gonna be taking place in New York in some office because this is also we're talking like late '80s when, um, every Cassius King, like I mean, the '80s, where all all the pro money and everything. Like now, it looks like, hey, now we're gonna take a slap at you know the the CEO douchebags of the '80s. Like that's what it looks like. Is I sign in. And then look, what was the tagline? Here they go again. And that was it. It was beautiful. Okay. Well, you know, fine. Fine. I'll, I'll give you that one. We'll, we'll end that topic off on a good note because it makes no sense. We don't want to argue. We're friends here. We're, we're, you know, <laughs> we're keeping it peaceful. That is the thing. And Dignified those discussions. Are pretty... He said dignified. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into the next. Well, that's funny that you said dignified because the mm -hmm. next character, um, James Bond, is is the epitome of dignified when it comes to film and uh, film franchises. Like he's probably the biggest one out there. And for years, we didn't know who our next James Bond after Daniel Craig was going to be. And then uh, all of a sudden, they announced this uh, recently that is going to be what's his name? Aaron. Aaron Taylor Aaron, Johnson. Aaron. Taylor this guy. Johnson. Yeah. So yeah. we think it might be this dude. We think. There's like a lot of rumors on the table right. that There's maybe rumors. it's this yeah. dude. Uh, we think that maybe he's been sent a contract, and if so, we'll know in a few days. Um, And so like that came from like an insider source, but this is still very much insider baseball as to whether or not this guy's actually going to be uh, the person or not. Mm -hmm. But what do you think of this selection if he is? <laughs> well, Lee... I let, let me dial it back. Let me dial it back. Let's talk <laughs> about some previous James Bonds and let's go from they there just... and just say in what they brought to and the God. franchise. Um, Sean Connery. That's uh, just he's he set the he set the template. You're gonna get magnetism, sex appeal, confidence, controversy later on, but that wasn't then. At the time, Sean Connery was it. That was the James Bond. And then after that, Roger Moore. Very different guy. Very different vibe in his movies. You get a little more comedy, a little more realism, a little more practicality came, coming from him because he 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 wasn't a he was a fit guy. You know, I mean, he was he looked like a guy, and he was a little bit more approachable, that kind of guy. And then uh, Timothy Dalton, you got your dark edginess for like a couple movies in the eighties. Then we got to Pierce Brosnan, and Pierce Brosnan, like that was me growing up. That was the the James Bonds that were coming out. But then now looking back, I'm like. He was pretty, but he was like, it was very gadget focused because, hell, Pierce Brosnan couldn't even drive a manual car, let, let alone, like, was he good at fist fights? All right. So Pierce Brosnan was definitely pretty, flirty, very gadget heavy. And then you got Daniel Craig. And Daniel Craig was gritty, he was tactical, he was practical, and he was fallible. He got his ass kicked. You never seen James Bond get his ass kicked like Daniel Craig got his ass kicked in a lot of these movies. That was realism, and I definitely appreciated that. Now, eighty percent confirmed on Aaron Taylor Johnson. What is he gonna bring to the franchise? What more? What more stories can we get out of James Bond with this guy? Okay, first off, I'm taking lots and lots of offense to your mm -hmm. assessment of Pierce Brosnan. Yes, yes. I think he was a really good Bond. I think what? that he did what he was supposed to do. He gave mm -hmm. you eyebrow. He gave you charisma. He gave you mysteriousness. He gave you Bond. He actually looked like Bond of the character from the books. Like, um, we're yeah. not going to talk about the writing during those movies that he was a part of. I was about that was to not say because him. where he those got movies the script, Okay. He the came to work, he got the, 
exactly no, hold on, but he, he no he came to work he got the script he yeah. said this is what you want me to do this is the type of bond you want all right let me do it and he did that to the best of his and abilities he was flirty. okay he so was we're going to leave Chris Ross's bond out of this yeah yeah he was very pretty <laughs> <laughs> yes yes he was and but daniel craig was a different type of bond very yeah. very true and i think you kind of have to wonder like how much the actual actors personalities go in to um what the writers decide to write for that for those specific bonds that movies that they're going to be working in as the lead man you know what i mean which i and think we is know it. very little mm-hmm. about aaron taylor johnson yeah uh, i at least i know very little about him so it's mm-hmm. just like okay what kind of guy is he what kind of bond is he going to give us if he's actually in fact the bond and you know i feel like that's in itself is tells you a lot kind of like um with a doctor who where it's like they have to announce who the Doctor Who is and then they write to that person. Like say they with James right. Bond, who's the actor playing it and then they write the films to that actor. When, when usually you think like, oh, it's it's the same character. Shouldn't it just be like, you know, the actor adapts to the script? No, it's the other way around because each yeah. one is a different one. Right, and this, maybe that's the reason why they took so long and hype, you would think went through so many different actors or so many different choices before they so finally couple, settled on him. There's a couple other choices on the table. Uh, this dude is not the only choice on the table right now. Yeah. Uh, oh, actually, like, okay, Sarah's got the tea. Yeah, so Sarah like, the there's now like a get 80% you, get of all bets on a new favorite. Like that's kind of what's come down the pipe. So like, mm-hmm. this dude is definitely a forefronter, as is Henry Cavill. Um, but this I mean, other Henry dude, Cavill, baby, absolutely. Right? We love oh. Henry Cavill, we love, we love. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was but saying James, to myself that if they give him this guy the role, they're gonna have to henry cavill treatment that's what i thought of like what happened to henry right right um uh so james norton yeah. is this other person that they're considering james norton yeah i have to google him i'm sorry james norton sorry james norton i have to look you up james norton james norton oh handsome man norton. obviously yeah. Uh, yeah not okay. about the dude not about the a lot of these movies i've not seen oh he was in bob marley one love but i mean obviously not the main character so i do not could not tell you yeah i have not seen any of these what? movies uh, yeah. james is not his uh, regine Payne. i have no Ooh, idea who that is strong really jawline he's also yeah strong jawline right yeah, <laughs> another, another actor with a strong. I mean, if he can, really he can break out of like. break out of a jail cell with that chin, but you know, I Actually, I can I tell think... you, Aaron Taylor Johnson was in Kick Ass, the two Kick the the Kick Asses, uh, both the Kick Ass movies. That was uh, that was uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Really? I, I, yeah, I, never seen. Okay, him. cool. It's just me. You've seen the Kick Asses. Cool. Um, those were a great I series. Told great you, couple I, movies. This guy. This but, guy which fell it, but, onto my radar with the announcement that he might be Bond. That's, exactly, right? That's which got on most like, people's At least Reggie Jean Page, I knew. Like, Bridgerton was all over the place. And we thought for the longest time that he was a serious contender to uh-huh. play Bond, which would have been great. Yeah. Because, you know, Blondes, like you said, I mean, Bonds have, you know, historically, they, they've all been white guys. Which, I mean, yeah. it's fine. It's, 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 a, it's a story that really very much plays to that trope and that stereotype. But you just... <laughs> In this day and age, and with all due respect to the producers of Bond, because I'm in awe of those women. Uh, but, you know, let's try to open, I, I would think, and what a lot of people wanted is to try to open it up a little bit more and try to give us something different. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was like saying that um, certain people could, it was just like saying that they don't think that it could work or we don't know what the reasoning is behind it. Maybe they just want to stay true to the story and the books and the, that they were Rick-ish adapting. Racism. Yeah. You know? I didn't say all of that. Can't get around I did. it. I did. I could say it. No, I, I could say well, it. Well, you say it then. I, mm-hmm. I, everyone, no, my mouth stays shut. It's racism, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's just, you, you, there were just a lot of actors. Like, And it's not, you can't even say that it was British racism. I just really think that. It's always a sprinkling. It's not I, the main thing, but it's always a sprinkling. It's the seasoning they use. Mm-hmm. Who was it that played Lashana Lynch? She was a black female Bond. And oh, yes. she played Nomi in No Time to Die. And mm-hmm. it was just like, there was just this great appetizer of, yes, okay, here's the franchise. We're moving into the future. We're doing things that America itself wouldn't do. And then... It's refreshing. It's something something new. Right. And, the, and for some reason, they just decided, okay, well, if we're going to make this movie again, we're going to make it with a guy and, you know, the guy's going to be white. It's going to be a different, it's going to be the same formula that, that we used before in the past. And 
we're playing off the guy to you know and the fact that it's an amazing it's a major franchise to to sell this thing which i like i said you know what you're about your money this is your your movies cost over 300 million dollars to make i am not the one to tell you what to do and how to do it and but every it single nice and every single <laughs> bond had movie a little bit more yeah. than just know me and lasagna La- lashonda lynch doing you know that little bit part mm-hmm. which was not a little bit part because she was magnificent in it and but just Give us a feature. Give us a feature. Super <laughs> new. Change it up. Damn it. What well, more? Give us like a, the I James Bond franchise needs like, an enema. Okay? okay, that's what it needs. Jenna Bond. Give me Jenna Bond. Okay, like I'm, I'm fine Gen- with that. Jenna Bond would have been great. You yeah. know, give me a little spinoff I, franchise. Everybody, <laughs> just give, give me a little it. streaming service of a Jenna Bond. Like, give you me know? just validate my existence and my impossible my possible double life as a spy you know that umana hari existed it, it was a real yeah. thing it was just bond. like jane bond i'm like hell yeah give me a jane bond it's like they hold they hold this character as bible and if you're gonna do that that's fine and this is what you're gonna give us holding that character as bible then i guess you know we're still gonna watch it it's not to say that we're not gonna watch it it's just oh in know, every in ideal I mean, i'm looking world, at it every james bond movie has has always made way over money back like hand over fist oh, yeah. it's always oh, yeah. 100%. It, it yeah. but they, can't, but they like can't keep leaning on it is what i'm saying and mm-hmm. and, and if it is aaron taylor johnson like i said he did the kick asses um there it was action kick comedy asses. so if that's going to be their new angle with james bond is is to, hey you're going to have a little bit of a laugh with this or he's going to be a little bit more infallible like he can take you know he'll get hit like ah you know and then punch back you know kind of like how jackie chan did <laughs> Okay, maybe we can work with that, but it's like it's gotta it's gotta justify its its revitalization. Because what what was the last uh, Bond movie that came out was three years ago. I mean, a give ago. us a give us a breath, okay? Like give us a breath before we start another you know a new line of James Bond movies. You know, like okay, cool, No Time to Die, beautiful thing. Don't wash it away three years later with hey it's like hey here's a new spider-man hey here's a new spider-man like they did in the past I'm like give give us a break okay give us a give us a minute to you know have our moment with the with you know the end of daniel craig and then start a new one i'm like three years later man i'm like okay come on guys like did you have no know. other that new ideas like I, I mean i think they put production. daniel craig to bed you know what i mean you know yeah. what i mean like that's that's five on production you know what i mean you know that yeah. you're really taking a movie for a year for release uh, so, like, even if they started production tomorrow, we're still not going to see this movie for another year minimum. Probably oh, tw- 2026, at probably. Least. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I would give it 2027 with the way the industry is going right now. The but, way it is playing I mean, catch they, up. I, I, feel like, I feel like they've put Daniel Craig to bed. Um, mm-hmm. They've tucked it in nicely. They, they've supplied him with milk and cookies. So, they, they said, they thank you very much for doing go. your and job. Just... And they've put a couple of <clears throat> dozens of thousands of hundreds of of millions of quarters under his bed and said, you may now rest. You did good. You kissed him on the the forehead like, you did good, Daniel. You did it, Daniel. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you so much that you brought Mm -hmm. us back. Um, So the fact that they take three years to even come to this point where it may be announced, because you know, like this information, there was speculation for years, but this information where somebody might be signing a contract didn't just come out of the willy-nilly. A source didn't say this. Like, this probably came somewhere directly from that camp which means three years is a long time to be auditioning people and checking backgrounds and vetting and being like could you possibly be our bond you know meet with our do writers meet with our potential script? directors to do this do you think they already had a script three years ago i don't know that they would have had a well, script the way three those, years ago. Have have the way those one, women I mean, produce things for auditions. Probably, yeah. the way those women do things it, they probably do i mean yeah this 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 franchise is like a small country, you know. James Bond <laughs> is just literally a small country. Like this a franchise, six, don't one, joke. Two, three, four, so, five, six, seven, I wouldn't eight, be surprised three, if they do. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Hold on a second, I'm counting how many there were. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 James Bond movies. 25. <laughs> That's a lot of Bond. That's a lot of Bond, baby. That's a lot of Bond, and and I'm really thinking that they're trying to make this a legacy where they'll have more Bond. This is probably the only movie franchise that they can reboot over and over and over and over again, and people will still go for it. But then right? it's also, 
bond post Cold War, they've proven that yes, that is a viable like bond still oh, yeah. viable after the Cold War because um because that was the reason for James Bond. But then after the wall fell, it's like okay, who's the new enemy? And they've been able to still like keep it you know keep it alive, whatever. Like okay, hey, there's terrorism all over the world. They Bond can fight them all, and so like okay, so mm-hmm. like so we can say like it's it's test the time they can do it. So but we're gonna see how. How they're going to do it, know. we don't know. Well, I'm. that's very true. I mean, Barbara Broccoli, she is fantastic. She is brilliant. And mm-hmm. she's running the show. So, and you know when a woman runs the show, things get we're done. in good hands. Things we are get good, done. Good hands. Thing, there's mm-hmm. a lot of news surrounding if it is going to be Aaron Taylor Johnson. Uh, there's a lot of people that are upset with his background. Um, Why? There's a lot of oh. like anti-Semitism happening in regards to him. Or being cast. Is and he like, Jewish? Which, oh, yeah, he's Jewish. Oh, oh, I so thought like, he was being anti-Semitic. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no the other no, way, okay. people being like, I won't ke- go see the movie if you're going to cast a Jewish dude. Um, but, so, like, that's a really hot button topic, which is British great. seasoning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, like, that's definitely up on the conversation right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. We'll see. That's not going to be my conversation. Um, mm-hmm. Sorry. Nope. <laughs> the, that is a hot button ticket that I feel like if you don't have enough information, just don't. I mean, mm-hmm. stay, stay out of that one. But hopefully, yep. like, hopefully their backups are ready to go, if that's the case. <laughs> the question but, is, it, is it a good look to have a, a Jewish bond with everything that's happening with Israel right now? Well, is that where Paul Lubin wants to take it, or do we want to like again try to play the like life and art are separate? I mean, again, it's twenty twenty seven. We'll see what the what the how things are looking then. And I'm sure that's what they're weighing. Uh, okay, listen, and... the world's on fire now. We'll probably be still be on fire in twenty twenty seven. Like, we'll and just have a little bit more ashes make it to do. Let's just say, you know. Oh, uh, because the, the eclipse is tomorrow, right? So you know, see? all cell phone yeah, services yeah, yeah. going out. Oh, what in, what, is, it, is it the 8th? <laughs> I thought it was the 8th. I don't know. We'll get around to it. No, it's tomorrow, isn't it? The, the eclipse? Lunar eclipse or in, in Libra or some stuff like that? Okay, anyway, I'm just saying. The world... Uh, this topic, a lot of other topics... Mm-hmm. They're what Hollywood is about supposed to be talking about. You know what I mean? And I just really feel like Hollywood is itself... They're just not ready to talk about it in film format just yet because they're still trying to sort it out behind the scenes so yeah it would really really suck if they released this news that um mr taylor johnson is potentially the new bond and then have to pull it back because of all the conflicts that are going on around the world and the anti-semitism that by the way is not new oh it's, no it's, no, it's not, not new, new. It's not oh, new that's always been, been there and you know what i mean Mm-hmm. It's just really, really, it's really, really hot button topic right now, given what's going on in um, in the Middle East. Oh, yeah. So it, it would suck for the producers to, uh, for them to have to pull this information back and say we need to recast because some people are angry about it. But I mean, if they're going to do that, then why not just cast a black James Bond? Just do it. If you're gonna if you're gonna capitulate to that sentiment, just. <laughs> Cast the black guy and deal with the outcome of that. I mean, or do it at black that point, anything Make it black woman. Go for broke. Oh, Thank, ships can in. we get ships Lashonda in. back? Can we get Lashonda a payday, please? Okay, get Thank him back you. in. Okay. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> like, we literally, I literally thought when I was watching that movie that we were, she was, they were setting it up for her to be the next James Bond. The new 007. The, the new 007, or the, okay, Jane Bond, or whatever it is. Yeah. I'm, it's, it's like, it was like watching the American election, thinking, okay, Hillary's going to win, Hillary's going to win, and then all oh. of a sudden the Electoral College comes and just shoots your dreams down, and then we're, 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 we're stuck with you-know-who, and January mm-hmm. 6th, right? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. Hollywood... <laughs> This is like it's like Hollywood showing it's kind of showing its political colors. If or there's it's... if people are going to say because this guy is Jewish he can't be Bond, then it really does not get any more political than that. It also shows it would show cowardice on the production's side if they think that's a, a deciding factor for things. It's just like oh well, what if the news we shouldn't do this whatever. It's I mean, like, but come that's on. Hollywood. That's what we talked about last week of like having uh, a political opinion about stuff can get you fired from a show. 
I mean, yeah, we just saw that Gal, Gal Gadot uh, with the Wonder Woman franchise that uh, did, did not help her by her stating her opinions. So, you know, I don't no. know. You know what I mean? Like, that's a, it's a real thing because uh, it's, it's all about funding partners. It's all about like, where's money coming from? And like, what's that going to do to your box office? You know yeah. what I mean? If that's the energy you're getting out from the people that are going to your box office that are your diehard fans. But th- that is something really you've got to take into effect. And that sucks. It's incredibly shitty that that's where we are. Our entertainment, uh, their paycheck. Much, but how much control of the shit the fans have in how in your narratives, in your in your business decisions? When at the end of the day, a lot of what we hear is just fodder. Like you know, it, it's baseless fodder where people are like, "We're they're sure, going sure. off of rumors and the conjecture." So like, how much do you bend to that and be like, "Oh, okay, well, just because people are saying this, that means we can't do this." Like, it, they haven't even made anything yet. You know, this is not. Made. This is not. This is not a screening where they're like, "Oh, okay, let's let let's test what we've done so far." Like, it's not even that. It's just people running off at the top of their lungs at something that they think that they know, which hasn't been confirmed. So, mm-hmm. as a business person, as a producer, as somebody in Hollywood, as an industry exec, how can you say, "Well, we need to make sure that we keep these comments in mind"? as we proceed with our pre-production and production, et cetera. How do you say, like, they have that much control? Do they? They really, yeah, should they even have that much control? Absolutely. Like, yeah, diehard fun. come on. Diehard fans are like, not diehard fans. How do you figure that you're going to tell me how I'm making what I'm making when, when I'm done making it? You're probably going to go watch it anyway. You may not, though. And that's the thing. It's like, it's it's how much are you making back on your box office? And right now, box office is so finite compared to what it was even 10 years ago, even five years ago. The reality They're is desperate. the economy is harder now than it was five years ago. The people that have expendable money to go see your movie are your middle class and up. They're not the everyday person. It's $14 for a movie ticket, another $14 at the concession, minimum. And you know, two I mean, hours, you say three hours I mean, of your time. I don't stop at the. Con- I don't see the concession. There's a big old block for the concession. <laughs> no, no, no. I, no, I go to concessions <laughs> you know so I, I mean? can get like, like a coffee or something. So I need to. So yeah. I can put the contents of my flask in. Like that's why I go to concessions. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, but like truly, it's you know what I mean. Like the actual people that are going to see a movie right now, uh, have an opinion and like have a say yeah. in how they want to spend their money and how people want to spend their money is a time and money is more precious yeah, than it was. Yeah. So, okay, like, that's fine. Have an opinion, but. It's like, okay, that's fine. Like, like last summer, in regards to like buying up stock for GameStop, you know what I mean? It's the same idea where like if people <laughs> get wind of something and decide to get on board with something, they're going to say, fuck the system one way or the other. And I think that that's yeah. like an important thing that like as a business owner, as somebody that like works as a producer in movies, you have to know who's on the other end buying your product, who's on the other end buying this thing. Who your demographic what, is, who's buying tickets. Wasn't that GameStop thing like a big mess? <laughs> oh, it's absolutely, it's still a big mess, but yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I, yeah, yeah. I I don't remember exactly what happened by it, but on oh, American video game. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Mm-hmm. But uh, fine. They they do have an opinion, and you're right. Their their opinion should be should be respected to a certain extent. But to respect their opinion to the point of where you're making production decisions or, or casting decisions about your your investment, I mean, there's got to be a place where the buck stops. There's and just got to be a place where the buck stops. That's it. And we're still talking. And we're talking about uh, um, as we see here this graph of the global box office all time theater and everything. Look at all of those taking place before 2020. That was uh-huh. when different time going to the movie yeah. was a different experience. Now, four years later, times more precious, money's more precious. It's is you're it gonna stay at there? home in a month anyway. You don't need box yeah, office exactly. at least only a month long anyway. You're gonna catch it on streaming. The reality is, like, how many of the movies of last year that were blockbusters that went to the Oscars did you guys go see in theaters? Two. Gonna... Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of, like, mm-hmm. the, what, like, eight, ten that get nominated? You know what I mean? I mean, it's also How's a funky this... year, too, because, again, 2023 <laughs> was half a year at most. And so, in terms of, you're like... I mean, inter- yes, no, half a year in regards to production, but, like, not half a year in regards to movie release. Like, by the time... You roll around to a new year. Your movie's in the can. You're done post. You know, by the time you launch a following Mostly. year, you know what your road to launch is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so a lot of movies that got released, but it's also then too you couldn't, as an actor, go out and promote that movie because because of the 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 lockout. So it was a different vibe then too. And so still then, box offices were 
Um, I mean, that was a good year. That last year and this year is a good year for studios to clear their shelves off. You know, like, hey, we got some stuff we've been like we've been waiting to release. Now's a good time to start releasing it because you know what's out there. One okay, but see, the one thing that did say will be will be theaters and increase attendance, or at least on a couple of occasions last year, was the fact that they were offering people to see movies at four bucks a pop. They were Boom. dramatically reduced this was uh, the dramatically reduced the ticket prices, which increased people going to see movies. People were seeing multiple movies in one day. I and remember honestly, as a they... kid with those prices. Absolutely, you go see multiple. My dad remembers as a kid with movies at 1950s and 60s prices. Like, yeah, that's what movies were supposed to be is to keep your kids busy. They were they were a cheap babysitter. And that yeah. was how you got to see movies after movies after movies. And that was it. Now it's like it's about the experience. Yeah, we want to lock people thing. in for three hours and we want to milk all the food, like all the ticket prize, the food prize, the drink prize, like even parking prize. Whether, oh, you want to have a, a seat? Well, you have to pay extra for a, a guaranteed seat rather than just like find your buddy, whatever, somewhere in there. It's like it's now like it, when it was for a while, it was let's milk people. Then when they did four dollar tickets. Guess what? Move over. I'm coming in. I'm watching this movie. I don't even know what it is. I just walked in. You know, basically, like, yeah, I, that's basically what happened. No, I looked at the movie time, poster and I said, "Yeah, I'll go see that." Jared, so, <laughs> screen time meant, meant something different in your household. I could tell. Um, it did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was raised but, by TV. It, no, but the thing is, yeah, with that, that model, not true. It doesn't it. <laughs> but with that model, with 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 having more discounted movie ticket prices days, like I mean, it's not something because you know we have Tuesdays, but the prices on Tuesday they increase, so Tuesday is no longer a thing. So, yeah. but if they do that, those events and they and they market it as events, and the studios get in on it. I mean, that's a way to not for to build up trust back in movie theaters, in in yeah, Cineplex that, or whatever it is or AMC. Is and 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 that's a way to for for studios to cheaply market their movies because it's cheap for people to go see them and it shows that they're listening to people. That's another but way of listening to audiences that's not, that actually works. But that's not how it works anymore. You know what I mean? Like that got by like the studios owning movie theaters got broken down in like the nineteen between the nineteen forties and the nineteen sixties due to the antitrust law. The studios yeah, are having that money something doing well in a theater. That's not where they're sending their money. That's to like it, get a portion of those ticket sales but like that's not where they're getting most of their money most of their money is coming in in like the pipelines that they do own and where it's just streaming and distribution later on mm -hmm. you know, it's regards yeah, to no the i'm not saying they're but... working on the back end there's a huge amount that's being made for sure in box office however like that's not their driving force of where they're going to recoup overall well, no, but it is a portion of it, and it's something that they should think about. I mean, you can't be obtuse and be like, well, we're going to release our films here, but not think about how we can market it to people who don't, who love movies, but they don't always want to spend 50 odd dollars when they go. Like, you can't be yeah. that obtuse. Yeah, but it's not them that, it's wor that are worried about whether or not theaters close. You know what I mean? Like, they will still find a way to sell their films and market stuff to people if theaters close. And that's the whole no, idea. No, I'm not talking about theaters. theaters. No, I'm not talking about if theaters close. I'm talking about trying to get more butts in the seat to watch your film. Yeah, yeah. but they're going to get butts in the seats regardless. Like, you're going to go see stuff. You're going to watch it at home. Like, that didn't used to be the thing unless you went to Blockbuster or bought the movie or bought the hard copy. We're in a different game now. The last 10 years are a totally different game in regards to getting butts in the seats. They don't... Studios, especially because they don't have an active investment in these things. You know what I mean? Like, they don't own movie theaters. That's They're legally not allowed to. Um, there's already question as to whether they're legally allowed to own streaming services and how that pipeline works. You know what I mean? That's already up for right. question in the way that we handle that. They don't have an active investment in the same way other than the percentage they're making back from box office to actually keep those theaters running. It's why Amazon was interested in AMC. You know what I mean? Because, Am but like, again, that goes back into the antitrust thing because, but exactly. Yeah. See what I mean? So like, it's more complicated than that as to why they, how much energy they put into box office. And again, like, that's a huge part of like their overall budget that's coming back in, but it's not the only way they're making money. Um, and so therefore it doesn't kill them if independent theaters die. It doesn't kill them if like AMC is going to go down or if Landmark goes down or if Cineplex goes down or goes under a new buy. You know, and that just creates more opportunity for them to create a new service to get direct to you. They care about getting stuff direct to you. That's why you can buy stuff on Amazon that's still in the theaters. That's why you can rent stuff on different streaming platforms that's still in those settings. Yeah. 
See, that's so cold. That 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 is just so frigid sounding. Yeah, but that that's business, mindset and that my frame is no. But that if that's what we're dealing with, if that's what we're dealing yep. with, and that if that's the new age that we're running into. And by the way, on the that's, note for that's streamers, not new, my but, love, uh, that's not no, new. No, but hold on, hold on, no. But on the note about streamers, if I'm renting a movie, why are you only giving me two days to watch? That's where Blockbuster <laughs> had these guys well, beat. Have okay. No, 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 no. That's the new releases. I remember no, no, you had no, no. two I'm days. You I'm, watched I'm it that night. Maybe, movie. maybe the second night or something happened. You know, exactly. Blockbuster gave us a week. Like if for, for what <laughs> no, no, I remember, that, that the was old, after the first the tales months. from the olden days and what mm. my brothers used to tell me. Blockbuster <laughs> gave you at least a week to watch movies. Hold like, on, let old man McJerry step in here and tell you. Um, when it was a new release, like the first two weeks to the first month, you had forty-eight hours. From the moment you checked out to when you had to throw that thing back in the slot. Like, and I remember yeah. my mom, did, like, fishtailing in the parking lot and just, like, tossing me out the window saying, yeah, get in the slot. We're almost late. Like, and, but then after the first two weeks or month, then you got your seven days, five to seven days mm -hmm. after that. Which, well, okay, again, fine. What, how, I'm how much of that. a hurry were you in? But again, yeah, same thing when it comes to uh, uh, renting for streaming. It's like, okay, yeah, to be honest, I'm not going to click watch you know or like rent or whatever until i'm literally like two minutes away from actually saying play on that thing so i do get that it's that it's 48 hours on that one that one makes sense but it's also and i haven't kept track of this what are the prices now for renting uh it's like, like 4.99 on apple 4.99 yeah I was, yeah I was, but it's it different than which one like I it know up to yeah it could be up to 25 dollars for new movies so in twenty five dollars, you can kiss my ass. Yeah, for twenty five dollars. Yeah, you know, twenty five dollars if you want to own it. If you want to then own that digital copy, you own it until it. they take it off their platform, but if the and then you don't own it. Of course, I'm going to want to own it. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, if, I mean, own it. I mean, you going to send me the Blu-ray? Like, what do you mean, own it? Yeah, I mean, like, okay, we're back to the Blu-ray. Yeah. We're back yes. to the DVD player. What is Because you're not going to own anything what when it's on their platform that they can delete at any moment. People keep referring. Yeah. Lord Jesus, what is? Okay, yes. Anyway. Speaking of cold, calculated Listen. movements from the mid, because that's where we're at. Machines. <laughs> <laughs> that is where we're at. <laughs> um, basically, we're t AI. I I'm, yeah. I'm just going to come out right out and say it. AI, artificial intelligence. Okay, it's here. It's Good here. movie. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, see what I did there? Okay. No, I see it. I see it. <laughs> Uh, so no, it was a good movie, mm -hmm. but it's also a very real development. Have you watched a, the videos? Like the ten oh, yeah, minutes? It's crazy. It is oh, yeah. uncomfortable. I've been, I've had a couple of clips on them. Yeah, no, I've had a couple of clips on them. Can you freak me out real quick? Can you can you just make me feel uncomfortable real quick? No, Thank no, you. no. They've got you. They've got you, Jared. They, what yeah, we're good. talking about is Sora, <laughs> the text to video. The text and video technology that Chat GP, or OpenAI, who Look owns Chat puppies. GPT, just dropped. Look at those fake puppies. Oh, look at those fake puppies. Jared, just put your, put your real. tongue back in your mouth, Jared. They're not real, put your but they're tongue. cute. They're not real lies. They're horrible. Cute lies. Look, the puppy paws oh. are made right. Oh, look, they're like, make puppy paws, but okay, not the no, so to them. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Which okay, this is weird. Where I'm like, okay, is this for me to take a trip to Borneo, or is this going to replace because they're all dead? Now, that we have to imagine this is what the animals look like because they're all extinct now. Like, I mean, it's like when when do we when it comes to these, what what are we going to use it for? Are we going to use it Everything. for expensive landscape shots that we can't do, or it's like uh, um or kind of like um, I would say Lord of the Rings Two Towers when they're showing like these vast scapes yeah, like, of these like tall towns and villages that aren't real but it's like are we going to use it for that and then we can do real whatever we in a in a closed set or it's like what are we going to use these videos for okay so i've seen some examples well, of people that like are using this in regards to like replacing green screen or replacing as a uh, filler as a I, filler like, for... follow, like, yeah as a filler or to like do a lot of their animatronic stuff um yeah. so there's this dude i follow on instagram where like what he does is uses AI to uh, do all of his transformations into like a creature or an alien and go from like human form into these other things. But he also works in the Unreal Engine and can like tweak Pirate stuff coffee. with the help of Zorm or the help with the help of like how AI is using prompts. Mm -hmm. uh, truthfully, that's weird. And this is all really cool. This takes out the need for a jib. This takes this out like weird. for a lot of this drone stuff that we like do and trying to get drone permits. 
um, we now like don't need to worry about doing that as much. You know what I mean? Okay, so like this, this cyberpunk world with the robot, yeah, that's expensive as hell to duplicate. You're trying to get me like Blade Runner world? It's expensive to do all that. And if just we're to doing build that a... props, expensive. Sorry, yeah, yeah just Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Now again, if it, if it was like what's that? That Street View in Tokyo, you couldn't get a guy with a tripod in Tokyo. You know, like I mean, like at what point are we going to be like? When do we need it? When do we not need it? You know? There's like, your little grabby one. Uh, my, yeah, I know. I like little magwai there. Work. Yeah. This will speed <laughs> up work for animators. This is like, we're already seeing this, like, as somebody that, like, works in production design, like, this speeds up my work for sure. Like, the, the amount of assets I have to deal with and Animators are going to suffer. So, like, 100% you know, animators. AI and generating, like, throwing in actor images to, like, create gallery photos that normally we would have to, like, book a gallery, have actors in extra days, like, create entire backstory photos for them or like have to get clearance yeah. on like there's such a huge jump in what we can do with ai now but like i don't think dops are out of a job with this i think we're still pretty no. far away from this being perfect i think this in collaboration with the unreal engine and getting operators that understand how to talk to this thing while being able to manipulate every single one of these elements like we're not quite there yet we will get there for sure and we will get it's there, there, get there like, yeah inside of the next two years that's where we will be and we'll have to figure that out I think B, uh, crew, B no, crew and second costs. units are going to suffer, but... No, it definitely cuts costs. It, 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 people don't have to spend as much money going on locations. Like you said, those aerials and drone shots, less props, less set scene to be built. It definitely does cut costs. And for certain people who own, um, who are filmmakers, if you don't have access to the big bucks, if they can get access to Sora, they're absolutely going to love it because that means that they can get out what they want to do faster and quicker. And um, you're going to spend less time in makeup. And and that's great. And you know what? As somebody who makes short film, I, well, it's films, period. Like, I, I, I wanted to crank up a feature for a long time now. This is probably going to be really helpful for me because then I won't have to worry about saying, okay, well, I need to pay this. I need to pay that. I need to find these locations because I could just type mm -hmm. it into a computer and it's just going to spit it out for me. However, movie making, film it's still a very human business. Yeah. Okay. And there are people who have families who need to provide them who need their jobs. Okay. I mean, and this is going to kill, wanna... and this is, Sora is going to kill a lot of jobs. You know, unless there's a way a to time. properly manage and no, but hold on. Unless there's a way to properly manage and, and, and contain it contain its uses it's going to kill a lot of jobs the basis though one of the major points of the sag strike was the fact that actors did not want to be able to be duplicated electronically with their their face and their likenesses be, and studios were trying to do that yeah or filmmaker whatever they were trying to do that <laughs> through the use of ai that was Heavy one of the major sticking points mm -hmm. now we have sora can you say okay well we're not going to touch the actors the writers already, we've already, got, AI's already got the writers out of the way, maybe, but mm -hmm. locations, sets, makeup, well, guys, so sad, but I think we a lot got of that now by a text. Yeah, so, I mean, like, like a lot that's of where that's swooping establishing shots, those are going to be, that's going to be the like the AI, but the human eye, I mean, AI is going to get there, mm -hmm. obviously, but there's still a gap until we get there where because because human eye can detect like wait that ain't right something's wrong about that that's just one of those traits that we have but i think short term commercials commercials are going to be able to crank that out really because commercials they could not spend less money on commercials that they don't have to for films there's going to be like Word's gonna get out. Oh, hey, this film used AI. I mean, how many? What was it? That the the, the new Marvel TV series uh, that came out, um, Secret War, or whatever. When even like there was like, oh, in the in the opening sequence, they used a couple AI shots. People immediately like threw up the red flag. They're like, screw this whole series. Why are you bothering doing that? Whatever. There's they're gonna have that dynamic where it's not going to be a complete takeover, but it's going to be a great way to fill in some really complicated shots. And short out some animators. I think that's going to be a lot, a lot of what we're going to see on the ground level. And then anything more than that, we're going to it's going to be remain to see. So we've got like two separate things going on here. We've got the use of AI yes. that's coming into like the media space or coming into the entertainment space. Uh, but we also have the issue of like 
production's down by 45% since 2022. There is less mm-hmm. than like 25% of the previous jobs that were available to the entertainment industry over a year ago. Oh, like, yeah. And that has nothing to do with AI. That has everything to do with where the industry is right this second. Um, mm-hmm. And that's not about to go away with the strikes with AI. See, like people aren't working. And that has nothing to do with what's happening with AI. With the other end of this, where like the SAG contracts near the end, because like we got kind of ratified and everyone's like, great, finish it up, get it dealt with. They're not going to use our likeness cool that's not actually what got put in the contract what got put in the contract is that they can still use your voice to train past ai and train them in that synthetic voice and they don't need your sign off on that if they have you in a movie and you've already signed the contract and you're like doing work for them they can take your voice and then reprogram it with ai uh to do other things as part of your contract um and that's what sag signed that's where we are so like ai is not going away the g7 summit was supposed to talk about ai and didn't in regards to like usage and global use of how this is getting implemented and so we're kind of just seeing the wild wild west of where this is going in regards to tech but it's uh it's not moving backwards and it's changing the landscape of jobs but i think that's the way you have to think about it is it's changing the landscape in the same way the internet changed the landscape of the library it doesn't make the library non-existent it doesn't make the library go away it just changes the way we absorb information or the way that we're using that tool I think that like budgets and the, be different, but budgets have been slashed forever. Like commercial budgets uh, five years ago were a hundred grand. I know because yep. I was doing them. Like it's commercial budgets now is like I'm getting I remember that. Like, that was good times for an actor. 30 grand, 20 grand. You know, do this all in 10K in a studio in two days. You know, that's not how you can afford a studio, my friend. I mean, that's that's where we are. Well, no, the fact. Okay. So the fact that you touched on something I like really important there. The fact that internet didn't change libraries. It just made it different. That's like saying cds don't change radio it just made it different which is fine it's going to make it different and i just think with the more ai gets popular in the filmmaking industry the more that we're going to have like a subset of filmmakers are being like well no we will never use ai because we're of the pure digital of the pure digital format and it's just it's just going to create division so not only is it going to create job loss I mean, we already all see that coming. It's just going to create the vision about how people want to do things and how much they want to pay to do things and how much they're willing to spend to do things, which is going to affect a lot of different, it was going to affect a lot of different people in this industry who are in a bunch of different professions. I'm not saying that it's not good to be able to reduce costs and have the option to reduce costs. We need that. Okay. This stuff is expensive. Cost of living, inflation. Yeah. Those are all different factors. However, while we're doing this, while we're taking advantage of this brand new shiny toy, there also has to be the consideration for people who have ded- dedicated and committed their lives to being in this industry. And the people who want to continue to pre- be in this industry, who have no other industry to go to because they've worked their lives in film or in television, and this is all they know how to do. And to get a job doing anything else, number one, it's not going to pay them as much. So their their quality of living is just going to go down. And number two, they have to retrain for a bunch of other stuff. Like, just think of the people that will be affected. How far are they willing to let it go? Mm-hmm. That's my only concern. I'm not saying that the AI tool is not great. It is. But how far are they willing to let it go? Where How many jobs are we going to cut back on? How many... <sighs> How much people are going to lose out to computers because the only the only thing people care about is the bottom line. You know what I mean? I mean, we're we're already there. Like we're we're cutting rates left and right. Like people came back from the like crew came back from the strikes and were reoffered contracts where they took eight percent out of the crew to pay the actors. Like if we want to, there's there's two issues there. One is the evolution of technology. The other is cost of living and like where we are with the economy and like the way budgets are getting structured and like the race to the bottom basically right um, and but i think whether this the, was the out film or not industry is supposed we're to be still smart. cutting budgets but the, it's no but it's the a film, business it's not about no, being smart. no it's, it's a business. business it's about making money no it's a business but filmmakers and we have the thing we're we're supposed to be smart we see things we we have the difficult conversations that people are not willing to have we give you opinions effect, objectives and viewpoints it, it, it frames of references for your daily life okay so if you understand that cost of living is going up and that the society that you serve is being able to not be able to afford the most basic of things. And you as a business have a way to reduce costs for your business. Then why doesn't some of that trickle back down to your customers? Ask that about Amazon. It doesn't. Amazon Amazon gives you cheap shit all the time. 
Amazon offers you free shipping and free returns. So, Amazon is doing what Amazon that. needs to do. Mm. No, but Amazon's making money on that. They're not actually sending the return back. They're then packaging up at a pallet and then selling that off again to another distributor. And they're not but taking their back in their return. The, they're taking the L&D but their and cost then to the the end L&D. user. But the cost to their end user is ultimately cheaper if the end user has gone out to a retail store. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's a couple bucks cheaper, but you have yeah. to buy a subscription for it. You have to have a membership for it. Right. But, sure. they, they, but they've all, but they, they have that automation, right? And Amazon... Amazon gives you that monthly subscription of being a prime member to receive those types of benefits. So what benefits is the film industry going to offer if they increasingly depend on AI to make their product? I mean, again, like I think you can get a variety of pricing at Amazon. You can get a variety of pricing at moving in movies. I mean, you can get your indie movies. You can go to an indie movie theater and pay less than $14 for a ticket. You pay eight bucks for a ticket. You know what I mean? Like there is a variety out there in regards to how to make a movie and how to make a budget. Um, I think what we're seeing from studios is like this big push of the race to the bottom. I mean, how can we make more money for less? But I think that's how a lot of businesses work. And I think we have to remember that like whether we like it or not, film's a business. You know what I mean? Like it's yes, we are making art and life is a reflection of art. And we're very fortunate to do that. But like it's a business. Okay. Business, take care of your customers. Show some customer service. Attend to us, please. That's that's yeah. my only please. Again, four dollar tickets to the movies. Four dollar tickets to the movies. I'll go see all the movies. I will see all the movies if I if there are four dollar tickets. Like Tyler Perry <laughs> has one of the best come up stories in all of filmmaking. Well, not all of filmmaking, but of recent modern filmmaking history. And he's had to put his plans to expand his soundstage, which is employing a lot of people in Atlanta, Georgia, or in Georgia itself, on hold because of this technology. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. It, it, because the way we make movies is changing. In the, same, in the same way that it's pushing us forward, it's holding us back. I think we're where gonna see a does lot it more stop? volumes. We're going to see a lot more transition into the volume wall, into things like the uh, immersion room, like what we have here. You know what I mean? Into like what, true. like the volume of like what Disney is using for Mandalorian. Like we're going to see stuff shift that way in regards to set right. design. It's going to be a lot of Sora like adapting mm. to that. Which, again, that's opening up more jobs. That's opening up more jobs in the IT sector. That's opening up more jobs for, like, the video game crossover people that are already, like, using the Unreal Engine and learning how to use AI and AI generation to kind of move that way. Just different um, so, yeah, jobs. It's, it's, re- it's different jobs. It's just retooling. Yeah. Okay, well, as an independent small filmmaker over here, hello, who doesn't have a budget of millions of, of dollars to work with, I would like to see a version of this technology opened up to us so we can use that to make our content because right now or sora is not available to the public which means that they're pushing it to the industry yeah and I mean, like, it's not it's not out the, yet I, it's, I, it's I mean still, no like, it is out. a select it is a select group of people like it's a select group of right. like, actors that's and directors that's it um, that's exactly very, what i'm saying so, to, like but it's in beta how it's still does in beta. this oh, right so mm-hmm. it helps businesses we're selling, we're selling product here, um, but nobody is thinking about the smaller studios or the people who are making films with features or who are putting it on their credit cards. Like, if release it to them. Chat GPT is open to everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Bard's release not. Like, it we're to in people. Canada, we don't have access to Bard. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of AI tools What's Bard? that we don't. I, 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 uh, I, it's the I Google version Ch- of Chat GPT. There's like no, 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 I don't no, want. I don't. AI is what we don't have access to here. You know what I mean? Sora just happens to be like an extension we don't have access to yet because it's in beta. Which is like Woo-hoo. that's okay. Like Sora will open up. It will be like Chat GPT where you can get like the three point five, where you can pay for the four. Like it will open up. Right now it's in beta, and we're still testing that thing. So like we're figuring out studios and directors and producers are not going to use this tool if it can't make the money um but by the time that it gets to us it's going to be either severely degraded or a lot of the features going to be cut back and they're like well no we're reserving these for it can do here for the the best things that it can do for the studios and for the big money people who can pay for it yeah but like how does it how does it better the the, the, the thing is how does it benefit the injury the industry as a whole Or is it just another way of Hollywood? Or if it's just another example of Hollywood elitism? Is that what OpenAI is trying to promote right now? I don't think it's about Hollywood elitism. I think it's about like they're trying to see who can back that tool. Like the reality is, in order to develop software, it takes money. 
you you have to have investors. You have to have people that are willing to pay the salaries of people that are going to sit at the desks and program that thing. The reason you go after people to test your beta is you want those people in your market. You want those people telling you where the bugs are, what you need more of, what you need fixed, because they're going to pay for that thing at the highest level and can pay for your beta. They can pay for you to test it. We are not the market that's paying for that test. And that's the truth with everything in every demographic for every business across the board. And you're looking for your investing partners. You're looking for your funding partners. So, of course, they're going to go after big studios first. That's if, if they can cut a two million, two hundred million dollar movie down to a hundred million dollars, you know, by using this tool, and there's a kickback for them in regards to like sales or this tool or how they price that thing. In the same way you price an Adobe subscription, right, out for a studio, it's the same idea. Okay, fine, but who's going to stop it, it from running them up? I'm not saying it doesn't suck for us, but that's well, unfortunately that's how it works, right? And but the yeah. fact is, does it have to suck? Does it have to be so severe? That's what I'm saying. Open I think that's AI. A big life question. So Sora can represent. Sora represents the end of a lot. <laughs> could possibly represent the end of a lot of jobs. Okay, so mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Let's just. It's a, it's a great technology. It's a great thing to have. Filmmakers are absolutely gonna, or studios are absolutely gonna love it. Filmmakers, when we get access to it, we might just love it, but. How does it affect the industry on a whole? Is, it, is it, it going to be good for all it of remains us? Remains to be seen. Can there be can there be, be a way where it's beneficial for business and beneficial for the people? That's my whole thing. And right it now, it doesn't it look depends like that. You right now, I just feel people. like people just want to run with it. Pardon me. Depends who you consider the people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> the that's people. the reality. <laughs> like, and the I mean, are we just going to be uh, um, um, left lying bleeding? Speaking of, <laughs> have we have you seen the new trailer for Love Lies Bleeding with uh, I went and Stewart? Saw it. I went and saw it, and it was amazing. It's it already was happened. Fucking amazing! This beautiful it's five act structure. It was so good. Five act. Tell me about this five act structure because I'm sick of the three act structure. Oh man, this is wild. It's like set in New Mexico. Uh, it's Kristen mm -hmm. Stewart's revival movie, and she's this like queer woman and fucking fabulous. Yeah. She does oh, yeah. look fierce. Oh, yeah. She so looks steamy. fierce as shit. 100%. That girl looks fierce as shit in this movie. Yeah, it's, it's a fucking steamy movie, man. You talked to your dad recently? And that mullet? Hell yeah. Why? Uh, it's got these like, beautiful homages to Quentin Tarantino with these like I'm little red beats. I'm also in love with Ed Harris. I mean, Ed Harris is to be loved. Uh, no, that would be no, my father-in-law. No, he's to be hated. No, he's to uh, be hated. That's what he if does. If he was up to he my does, mom, he, he Ed Harris would be well. my father-in-law. So, <laughs> does your wife know that? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, she knows. She's aware. She accepts it. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's set in the eighties. This movie is like. Oh, it is. Uh, okay, so... What are you doing? Yeah, it's eighty-nine. Get a lot of crazy ass water, okay. mostly. So what, she's a she's a firearm trained she bodybuilder. Huh. She needs a job. Says she'll do anything. God, it, like that hair, Ed Harris. Really yes. What the fuck you doing here, then? I love the eighties regalia. We can follow mm -hmm. that. I'm a bit more powerful than a punch. Huh? Fuck yeah. Call Doug, me yeah. Worse, Doug. The mustaches, nice, the nice. mullets. Huh? You don't understand. Mullet's cowboy boots. So I forget Ooh, the cowboy boots. That Oldsmobile? Hell yeah. Yeah, I got the car. They found the body. Looks like you got your wrapping a body in a rug the old-fashioned way. We'll just need to fight back. Oh, that's okay. I wouldn't tell them everything you ever did. That's juicing, baby. Are you threatening? Yep. Yep. <laughs> that was really stupid, honey. Oh, oh my god. Revenge gets rips. I'll never fall in love, okay? That song alone. Ah, right. Yeah. It's so 80s. But the soundtrack, the cars, I miss those cars. Those are good times.
Yeah, it's a good it's a good time. It's a real good time. Um, I mean, nostalgically looking steamy. back during the time, it was not that great. But um, but yeah, no, it's that steamy. looks it's New Mexico. It's gritty. Uh, it's five. That's just structure. New Mexico now is gritty. New Mexico at any point is gritty. That's in New Mexico. Yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, you know what I mean? It, it's got guns and sex and drugs and bodies and you know in what I mean? Ba- in uh, Bane, like muscle building, like. Yeah. <laughs> looks like she just hit like the bane button she mutated and... dude she mutated like, yeah the... and she did she was she a lot was... <laughs> but it looked insane from, it looked like, fun man? as shit no it does look fun as shit but Sarah's the only one I think that's actually seen it I haven't actually seen it yet because no um, I've been busy however it's an A24 movie so I'm sure that I'm gonna love it I'm yeah, so 110% Stewart... sure I'm gonna love it yeah, plays this like uh, girl that runs a gym, uh, and this really like gorgeous, gorgeous woman played by Katie mm-hmm. O'Brien comes in and like just like steals the show, steals her heart. Mm-hmm. Is like a a runaway hitchhiker type headed to Vegas to like win a bodybuilding competition. Mm-hmm. Um, and this character, this Jackie character, just like comes in and steals the show. Like she steals everybody's hearts, uh, and is like such a dangerous person and a person that will do anything to achieve their goal uh so like she will fuck anyone seduce anyone like she's going to vegas and that is the end you know what i mean she is gonna get there regardless uh and she convinces you that you love her and she loves you because that's what she feels in the moment but that's not her overall goal uh and it is wild it is wild to watch case do like fall in love with her it is wild to like see how their chemistry plays on screen and then you have ed harris and then you have this like whole arc with ed harris now he's like the baddest of the movie and you don't really get into like what his business is like it's very clear he's in corrupt business mm-hmm. uh, and is like been knocking people off and that's kind of like the arc of the movie is like unveiling all of his shit um so i don't want to ruin it like the end for you but like it's yeah it's wild it's Fucking wild. Uh, all set in the tone of the 80s, which is back, mm. by the way. We're all, we're doing a lot of 80s, 90s movies right now. That's very the vibe. And he's so, like, the 90s about to design ki- something. That's where we're back to. But is Kristen Stewart mm-hmm. believable in her as her character? A thousand percent. I thought she got outed forever ago. She's a thousand percent believable. She's so good. She's yeah. It's she's like, never not absolutely been absolutely wild. I don't think I've seen yeah. better than this. Ooh, yeah, a lot of Kristen Stewart's actually been pretty clutch with her uh, with her acting roles. She's yeah, she definitely brought it. Like yeah. it's her yeah, Even it's her, se- her it's her second life. I mean Twilight? we, I mean we can we just Twilight. we're including we're we're including Twilight in that are we? Uh, I'm Be again. Eh, we can just uh, move on past that. I mean, are we going to fault Robert Pattinson for his roles in Twilight? No, no, we did. We can no, just segment cut tenet. Twilight out and say <laughs> no, no, this no, no, is no, their no, second no. life I, now. You know, I I liked Robert Pattinson in Twilight. Like that vampire character was probably the most unrealistic vampire I've ever seen in my life, but he didn't. Mm-hmm. But but again, they're a little. This is new, Kristen. New Kristen. It, Okay, some... so you're saying yeah. she's believable. Is she worth? Is she, does she make the film? Why? Why did we get a Kristen Stewart lead in this? Tell us, Sarah. No. <laughs> um. Can we? Can we hear? Did we lose her? Did Sarah? we lose Sarah? Sarah, your mic. Babe, it won't. Me? Oh, there what? it is. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. We lost oh, your mic for a here second. You go. Hey, there you go. Sarah uh, didn't leave us. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, Kristen Stewart is like, tight with this director, this director, the UK director. She's 30. Okay. Well, this director's 30, a fucking uh, eight, three years. 33. Years That's old. Rose Glass, right? Rose Glass, yeah. What has yeah. yeah. Rose Glass okay. done to deserve this at 33? How does she get here? Feature. How does she get here? Is she a Nepo baby? Is this how we got? Is this how we got? Or no disrespect oh, to Rose Glass, but okay. how did we're we get a thirty-three year old Rose Glass? We're not talking about Nepo babies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it had to been a stellar first feature. It was. It won awards everywhere. Yeah, this okay. like okay. rock star indie first film that like made the circuit, uh, and then connected with A twenty four, and then like got this greenlit. Okay, I can see that. And then. you know, A twenty four is known for taking risks on their films because everything. They are. Everywhere, all at once. Um, talk to me. They were all like a screen success, 
festival circuit films that A24 picked up and said, yeah, we're going to redistribute this all around the world. We're going to use our connects for it. And they're not wrong. Like, they had a hit with Lady Bird. Um, we all know what Everything Everywhere All at Once did. I mean, it literally brought Michelle Yeoh's back, Michelle Yeoh's careers back. So, uh-huh. it, it, I just feel like the people at A24 really have, like, an instinct for choosing good stuff. Good stuff that wasn't that didn't cost hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of dollars to me, you know, it's so, they're they're the studio that that actually can recognize, hey, this is a good script. We don't have to commit yeah. that much money to it to get everything you want out of it. Like they yeah, they, they pick their script of, smartly. They're, it's not even that they're picking their script smartly. Like they're they're buying stuff okay. from indie producers that is really good indie. You know, that is uh, yes. there is a market for it. You know, it's not even yeah. what they're like necessarily backing and funding as a funding partner or as a distribution partner. Like they're also just picking up really great stuff yeah. under their banner at Festival Circuit, right? And and kudos, hats off to them because I I sat in rapture of every movie that they put out. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this one. Um, I've forgiven Kristen Stewart for Twilight a long time ago. I, I had to get I'm over pretty it. sure that she would appreciate that no one ever bring us up again, but she just can't get so. out. Of it. I she think, can't I get think, away from it ever. I honestly Robert think Samway. it's another one of those Madam Web situations where she was just like, mm. <laughs> like I should have been it, here. It got me it here, but her. it shouldn't. You know? And I'm I'm interesting to I'm interested to see what her co-star does. I don't know the name of the girl who is playing the bodybuilder who will stop at nothing to make it to Vegas uh, um, but you know the fact that she uh, so you obviously know her had a bulk up for this movie she, you know it. her from other stuff you know her for things like Ant-Man and the Wasp uh, she's in Mandalorian uh, she's in a couple of other things she's in the rookie she has a lot of TV stuff she hasn't done a ton of film stuff um, so it's kind okay. of exciting to see her transitioning into this um, it was going to be interesting yeah. to see her just transition, up the, the muscles, period. Like, I don't know how they did that, but my, my girl's like, well, I'm a bulking. I'm, I'm bulking up. And yeah. not only am I going to open myself vulnerably to be, like to put my body on the line like that physically, I'm, I'm going to put my emotional, my emotional space on the line, too, to play this really, uh, this queer character, this, this lesbian character in this relationship. And who has a mind frame like no other that apparently that we've seen. I mean, like as actresses, you know, for that me even seeing the movie, that's not an easy thing to do and do that convincingly and doing that convincingly enough for like people to be like, yeah, uh, let's make sure that this multi-million dollar movie gets out there to as many eyes as possible. Like that alone mm-hmm. is telling me what she does. Like she's done her job well. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. Um, um, I do believe that Kaya Bryan's a part of like the LGBTQ army. I do believe that like that's the way she leads. She? I believe so. Uh, yeah, I do believe that that was like an active choice as part of casting her. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, rep- thank you for keeping us feminine, Sarah. I, really yeah. know. I believe so. Yeah, no. You're educating us, Sarah. We loved yeah, it. This is learning. the school with Sarah. <laughs> got you. Got you. We're here to watch movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's dope, and I, I really can't, I can't really wait. I really can't wait to uh, see that one. Um, and the funny thing is, uh, Jerry did bring up nepotism, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, wondering if uh, it was something a bit of nepotism. I wish I could use. It was a bit wondering <laughs> if it was a. Ooh. We all wish, but if she was wondering if it was a bit of nepotism that brought us um, love lies bleeding, and and certain people from love lies bleeding, Kristen Stewart, and all that stuff. And it got me thinking of nepotism in the industry overall and nepotism as it relates to Lisa Bonet. Uh, I don't know why I chose Lisa Bonet. Okay. She's, yeah, yeah, yeah. she is just the, the woman. Power, that's, the power she, she has held she, in her hand. She just came to mind like, hey, <laughs> I she doing, broke girl? Lenny. Right, she rose well, she, and broke okay, that then man. She did break Lenny. She gave Lenny, Lenny some of his best shit. Okay. Oh right. no, no, she she raised him up, and then <laughs> definitely you lift him up. Yeah. Um, but when you talk about like people being able to choose good products or products, <laughs> good producers, uh-huh. he was a or you know, she is a woman that's just able to choose 
good men. Like, I honestly credit her with reviving Lenny Kravitz's career mm-hmm. and giving it to Lamoa purpose. Mm-hmm. And just giving Zoe Kravitz that essence of that it girl essence. Do you know what I mean? The it girl for the ages. That and mystique-ish. she wasn't yeah. nepotism herself. But she spawned nepotism in her womb. And mm-hmm. I think she, she fostered not- it credit for that <laughs> i mean yes I mean, like, cre- but that's a that's a lot of hollywood like how far back do you want to go here in regards to nepotism like george clooney falls under nepotism nicholas cage falls under nepotism uh-huh. jen anison falls under nepotism like how far do you want to go back here because we've been doing this for like 80 years we've been breeding stars let's go years. let's go You're, let's like, go girl you sound like you want to go let's go let's go <laughs> you know what i mean like we can go back that cake. Mm-hmm. give me some of that like, cake. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know what I mean? We can go back to Liza Minnelli. Liza Minnelli is technically nepotism. You're in her mother's Judy Garland. She... Yeah. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Liza Minnelli. Minnelli. Who's her yeah. mama? Judy Garland. Who's Liza Minnelli? What? Judy yeah. Garland? <gasps> yes. Yeah. The whole time. Yeah. The whole, whole time. time. Her dad's name is too. I can't remember the how my head of that Sarah. Is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, y'all. I mean, like Timothy Chalamet. You know what I mean? Uh, Liza Minnelli, Minnelli looks Nicole nothing Richie. like Julie. Ne- Liza Minnelli looks nothing like her mother. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, like uh, we've been doing nepotism a long, long ass Carrie, time. Like that's just Carrie kind Fisher. of the business of Hollywood. Carrie yeah. Fisher. Mm-hmm. Right, but when does it work? When does it work? A lot. I think a lot of our. If you like, we just listed off like probably half of Hollywood. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, right. No, 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 but it works for it. No, but when does okay? But when does it work? And when does it work? Like, um, these people are actually good, and they're not just writing off their parents' coattails. And if their parents weren't who they were, they would have still got jobs in the industry. I die. What are they? The hard that question to answer. If you're, if you're. Or is it just nepotism I mean, that we're Drew, relying on? Drew Barrymore is another example. You know what I mean? Drew Barrymore was like at parties at nine years old. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've ever like read her backstory, like it's really tragic in regards to being brought up by Hollywood and having like famous Hollywood parents. Um, so I yeah. think that like you just, everybody grows up different. Uh, Willow and Jaden Smith are another great example of like nepotism. You know what I mean? You just grow up different. There are a different set of rules that you play by by growing up with parents that are famous and you learn different things. But um, also, but, um, now, but there, nowadays you but, get, I mean, we're getting into the generation of people of color's kids finally get to have their shot now too, which is not a thing in the past. Like yeah, Ice Cube's kid, O'Shea, um, O'Shea, what was his name? O'Shea, ja- uh, O'Shea Jackson, when he played his dad in Straight Outta Compton, Ice Cube made him audition for that role. He didn't just give it to him, but even Ice Cube was saying, like, yeah, now it's our turn to help our kids and have some lineage and have some nepos, whatever, and we're going to take yeah. that shot. And I'm like, okay, we're, I'm for it. Denzel okay, Washington's so, yeah. kid, same thing. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, he was just, no, he yes, went and saw John all David his buddies. Mm-hmm. Yes, John David is his thing, and then, yes, we have Tracy Ellis Ross, and, but, and, of course, okay, I feel like they worked, and they would work if their parents weren't who they were. But, Certain people may have never gotten the chance if her parents weren't who they were. And I'm going to give that to Angelina Jolie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Angelina Jolie, yeah. I mean, she's great. I love her work. I think she is an amazing actress and and director. But would she have gotten the start if she had gotten if her father wasn't who he was? Wasn't John Boyd. Yeah. I don't know about that. I I I think that's the case with everybody. It's right place, right time. That's so much of hollywood at any given time only two percent of actors are working like that's just the odds that's just the shot you want as many doors open as you possibly can you know, yeah you yeah. happen to have parents that open those doors it's the same thing i mean like you can look nepotism doesn't just exist in our industry like if you want to go over and like look at korea you can look at like samsung samsung <laughs> is like the <laughs> definition of nepotism you know what i mean you want to get into like like the, the nepotism babies that come through there and like how that's all worked out you know what i mean like that's this is not an oddity. We just happen to be very public and forward facing about it. But like nepotism, yeah, we is just get to the see it. We just get to see it on screen. Yeah, yeah, that's all what? it is. But like, I, I we're mean, in the business of it... breeding stars. 
we are in the business of creating stars and, and we're also in the business of giving people opportunities. And I mean, but these people have gotten the same opportunities if they didn't call their parents names all the time. There's a lot of people that refuse to say that my parents are so and so because they're like, the, number one, they don't want to be they don't want to be categorized um, as somebody who had to name drop in order to get a job. And then number two, they don't want to be in their parents shadow. And like, do you give those people more respect? Like not just actors, but directors, writers, do you give them more respect because they're like, no, I'm going to come up in a different way. Or do you say, well, um, the fact that you did that and you still made it up, that's great, but we're still going to call you by your parents. We're still going to call you by your parents' show names, or we're still going to keep your parents in your, as a topic of conversation when we mention you because um, you are they are who they are. It depends if you change the name or not. Movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. After you've made your first movie, you know what I mean? That's that's you. You're done. You know what I mean? Like that's either you did test. a good job or you didn't. Yeah. That's your that's your test. Are you a Colin Hanks or are you a Chet Hanks? You know? Chet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, sometimes Nepo doesn't always work out. No, wait, what do you mean it didn't always work out? Sometimes it always well, sometimes had, just... he had us for a minute. Chet had us. How do you mean? For a hot and he, minute. And, no, then we, but... and, then, and then he walked in the room and he opened his mouth and that's where it ended. Womp womp. Yeah. That's why it's like, hey, I mean, same thing with what is it? Uh, um, what are the, What's the old saying? A pretty face is nice, but it only works for two minutes and then you have to start talking. And that's, that's when you, true. you know, that's when you got to step up or step out. And then Chet's face, you know. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. But... <laughs> Calling up or one... Chet out. Yeah. <laughs> the one, the one actor, will go, I will say that didn't get the career that her mother got was Mamie Gunther. Um, she's great. I, I think you know she's probably on the level of her mother's acting when, um, when we talk about her. But she doesn't have Meryl's career. It's mm. and no. it feels like it's harder for her to get roles. And I kind of feel like uh, the I just kind of like Meryl didn't have case. Meryl's career. For you know what I mean? Meryl, Meryl got told. Mer Meryl Shipp got told constantly. Uh, yeah. in her early days that like she wasn't gonna work she got told all the time in her early 30s when she walked into auditions that she wasn't pretty enough that she wasn't the right size the right, right weight the right look um she has like tons of stories about talking about like how going home on the subway that she wasn't the right fit for all these things um so again like just young just early early in their career yeah. and it, Mer most of meryl's best work has been later in her life later in her career and then just stuck it out you know Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, I I I might give you that one. Pers perseverance might be it, and she may get that way that one breakthrough role, that one breakout role that gives you her the credit that she deserves. But mm -hmm. you would think the fact that she would be fast tracked off the fact that she is Meryl Streep's daughter, and she is an incredible actress herself. That is an example, I think, of nepotism just not working in the industry. Like it just didn't kickstart with her, and that's not. I mean, like, why didn't she receive that t same type of privilege, you know? I, don't know, I, I couldn't tell you because I haven't seen any of her films, so I couldn't tell you if she's worth her weight in salt or she, not. She is worth her weight. I definitely, I well, I'm, I'm saying that. I've seen her in TV. I've seen her in a couple of films. She's done a couple of bit. Um, she's done a couple of roles, mainly in TV, but she is an, and she has done some film roles, and I'm, I'm just like, come on, come on. You give a, you have chops. Give this, just push do it. her. Just she just give needs it. to find a role. She needs to find that role. She needs to she needs to find her own love lies bleeding, you know, and just like yeah, really pay her own tough, right. Like you're trying, yeah. like especially right out of the gate, you're trying to play the middle of the road. You're trying not to do too much. You're trying not to typecast yourself. You're trying not to like you know what I mean. Get yourself in a place where you're like only gonna be, get picked for that role, um, which happens yeah. to actors. You know what I mean? Like yeah. in the office. Like the actor that plays Dwight Schrute on The Office, like quite literally pitched himself in a role so well, Rain he's Wilson. had a hard time working since. Yeah, Rain Wilson. To the you point where I mean? he's like, fighting for people to call him Rain Wilson because he oh, yeah, really? he's going to Dwight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Which, by the way, I Rain Wilson has some like, good movies. Poor guy. He's incredible. He's incredibly talented. Uh, but that you know what I mean. It if you do something so well, people are only going to see you one way. It's why we call it typecasting. You know, uh, why right. I was just like do right to an actor's agent and be like, hey, I would love to see you uh, in a different role. And I have this short film. I can pay you X amount of money to do this thing. I'm looking at this, this and this for distribution. And most of the time they'll take it because they right. want to break out right. of their typecasting. 
You know what I mean? That's for indie filmmakers. Those of you that are indie filmmakers, that's a great tip. If you if you really love an actor, look at what they're good at, and then look at what they've never done, and then write something for them that they've never done. And odds are, for like a specific amount of money and for mm. being put up for travel, you can get them in your movie. Give yeah, give an actor a, a taste, a chance at something different. They are, every actor like that has been shoehorned this way wants to try to go that way. Give them that shot; they'll take it. And a lot Absolutely. of people deserve the shot, regardless of who their parents are. Or just like. You know, that's a conversation that comes up all too often. In a couple of years, the topic was hot. And it's just like, don't, like Sarah said, don't pigeonhole people based on who their parents are or what the type of the roles that they play. I mean, the, mm -hmm. like, they could offer so much more. You don't know if they're offering that much more. But hey, since we already know about them, just, just put them up there and let me see if it works out. And if it doesn't work out, well, that's fine. Maybe they don't have their parent skill, but I'm going to end this topic right now because I'm just running around in circles and I just don't understand why I'm continuing to run around in circles. But I think it has something to do <laughs> with the next topic that I <laughs> that I'm going to I, I'm going to try to lean into here, which is mm. Alien Romulus, mm? the trailer mm. for Alien Romulus. OK, have, have now we we're seen getting this into trailer it. yet. Now we're getting because, into my territory. Because we were we, we touched on um, up and comers in the, in the mm -hmm. industry, and then we also we touched on um, people who've been in the industry because they know people and they got the jobs and they got because they know people. What do you guys think of this? Mind you, it's I, just a teaser trailer, so let's be gentle. I, you know what? I as a, since this is a teaser trailer, and we might need to be wrapping up this episode. I want to tease this for next time because I have a lot of opinions on the director of what this franchise could be. Is this the new? Mm, look at that blood! I love that blood. That's mm. Fede Alvarez. Oh, I love what he brings. I love what he does. Seventy thousand gallons of blood. That's every time I think of him. Mm, look at that coming out of the mouth. Oh, I love it. Of that. Mm. We can have a deep, deep conversation about oh, this. Oh, I want to have that deep, deep conversation about yes. this. Yes. Oh, I have opinions about this movie, of the franchise, of everything. But we're gonna have to tease that out right now because we're gonna have to get to that for next time. Because mm, I have a lot to talk about with that one. I'm excited about that. Okay, so you, so you got us through the sci-fi next time. Oh, I got you yeah. on the sci-fi next one. I got opinions on uh, the Alien. I got a play, uh, uh, Alien franchise, uh, um, the Planet of the Apes. We can talk about the new Ghostbusters that came out. All the sci-fi franchises. I'm going to be talking about that one a lot. And I'm excited about that one. But we but we got to wrap up this episode. So that was the teaser. No! Why do we The teaser no, for the okay, teaser. Bye, guys. Yeah. Get yeah. out. <laughs> Later, y'all. <laughs> All right. It's been fantastic talking with you. Great discussions. So we settled, um, we have the new James Bond, right? We, d we decided it's Jane Bond. It's going to be Jane Bond. It's settled. Yeah, Jane. Here we go. That's it. <laughs>